Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I, when I planned my, what I was going to say here, I almost started out with saying, today we're going to try something really new. But of course, today what we're doing is trying something really, really old. Uh, the, this particular psalm, the first reading, Psalm 136, was written in the form of verse and response. Uh, it, many of these were intended to be sung. Often there would be a leader and a chorus. Today I'm going to be the leader. You're going to be the chorus. Luckily, we're not going to sing it. So after each verse, you'll respond with the, with the response, which is here written in your program. Uh, it's also, you can read the, the uh, entire psalm on page 501 over your pew Bibles if you want to do it that way. But with each verse, there is the same response. So let's give it a try. Psalm 136. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For God's steadfast love endures See, you can do it. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of Lords, who alone does great wonders, who by understanding made the heavens, who spread out the earth on the waters. Who made the great lights? The sun to rule over the day. And the moon and stars to rule over the night. It is he who remembered us in our low estate. and rescued us from our foes. Who gives food to all flesh. Who give thanks to the God of heaven. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Beautiful Bach piece to get us ready for the word this morning together, coming from the book of Ezra. We began a series last Sunday on Ezra and Nehemiah, kind of some obscure, uh, seldom read books of the Old Testament, tucked away just after First and Second Chronicles, which nobody else reads any either. <laughs> but before Job and Esther and then on to the Psalms. So uh, kind of tucked away in there, but some real wisdom for us. We'll pick it up in verse 7 rather than verse 8, as your bulletin says. So they gave money to the Masons and the Carpenters and food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and to the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the grant that they had from King Cyrus of Persia. In the second year after their arrival at the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, and Yeshua, son of Josadak, made a beginning together with the rest of their people, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to have oversight of the work on the house of the Lord. And Yeshua with his sons and his kin, and Cadmiel and his sons, Benui and Hodaviah, along with the sons of Henadad, the Levites, their sons and kin, together took charge of the workers in the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and give thank, giving thanks to the Lord, for God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. 
But many of the priests and Levites and heads of families, old people who had seen the first house on its foundations, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard far away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May now the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You can't go home again. That's the title of a famous book by American author Thomas Wolfe. It's one of those books that is probably more famous for the title than for the story itself. I know I must confess I've quoted it often but have not read the book. As I thought of it for today's message, I thought I should read a little bit about it at least and read a few articles and it touches on themes of America in the 1920s like the stock market crash, but it also touches on universal human themes of going, of the desire to go home. We all experience the passage of time which makes it impossible to go home again. We simply can't go back to the way things were. Just the other day I was, I was thinking about my father's failing health and I wondered if he in his uh, mind these days would wish he could go back to 1965. I don't know why I picked that year, but it came to mind, and it would have been a good year for him. He and my mom had designed and had built their dream home in which to raise their four children. His career in business was going well, and he had his, most of his life ahead of him. Well, a couple summers ago, I drove by that house that was our family home, and it has been the family home to several other generations of families since then, and it's just simply not our home anymore. It doesn't look anything like how I remember it. You certainly can't go home again. We may not be able to go back in time or back to precisely how things were, but going home is a natural and I think healthy human desire. I certainly remember going home to visit my parents during my years away at college or as we were raising our children in California and Oregon. It was a joy to pull up into the driveway and to the family home and see the happiness I brought to my mother just by showing up. Reunions of family and college or military friends is something that strengthens bonds and gives us a sense of rootedness. So it is good to go home again. As we learned last week, the people of ancient Israel have returned home again. They've been in exile in Babylon, modern day Iraq, by the way, for about 70 years. Well, at least the elites, the leaders of Jerusalem were forced into exile as refugees. The rest of the population was scattered and reduced to servitude to their Babylonian masters. Now there's a new sheriff in town. Persia, modern day Iran, has risen in power and King Cyrus has conquered Babylon and has now sent the Hebrew people back home. Last week we learned how unusual and ostensibly generous it was of Cyrus to not only let them go home, but he made restitution and returned all of the gold and silver vessels for temple worship. And today we pick up the story where they arrive in Jerusalem and the first thing they do is restore the worship of God at the site of the temple of Solomon. In the opening verses of chapter 3, we learn that the people came together in Jerusalem in the seventh month after their return. The priests set up an altar on the site of the temple, even though it was nothing but rubble, and offered thanksgiving to God. And then in the second half of this chapter that we picked up at verse 7, was now in the second year of their return. They begin preparation for the rebuilding of the temple. The first thing you notice is the level of detail in this building project and the celebration that followed. Scholars have pointed out that the purpose of this detail is to show how this second temple was coming together just as the first one had under David and Solomon. The cedars were to come from Lebanon once again. The priests were to lead worship with trumpets and cymbals, and they were to sing responsively Psalm 136. You recognize that quote in the middle of the passage, I hope. 
We know that this psalm was sung in the Temple of Solomon hundreds of years earlier, according to 2 Chronicles 7, 3 and 4. And so the reaction of the people was to shout for joy and the very old people who remembered the glory of that first temple 70 years earlier shed tears of joy. The kind of joy that can only be felt after many years of suffering. They remembered the violence, the destruction, the decades as refugees. Now in their old age, they are home once more and they are filled with gratitude and joy. And we should note that all of this excitement was just for the laying of the foundation. The temple had not yet been restored. They had just marked out the parameters of the temple with the setting of foundation stones. Like I said, we poured our, the foundation footings for our new patio and retaining wall this week. It was exciting to be sure, but no one was weeping tears of joy. <laughs> Except maybe Rob Marlowe, who would like to see this thing get moving along. Perhaps a more appropriate analogy to the biblical story is the rebuilding of the World Trade Center in New York City. The whole world was shocked and stunned by the massive destruction of those majestic twin towers and the loss of life was staggering. And it continues today as first responders continue to suffer and die from cancers caused by exposure to all the toxic air of ground zero. For years, the debate raged about what to do with the site and how and what to rebuild. Even though I lived on the West Coast, I followed this story with great interest. I read all the articles in the paper about the meetings with developers and city leaders and victim families. Some wanted to rebuild the Twin Towers exactly as they were as a statement of defiance. Others wanted the entire site to be set aside as a memorial to that epic tragedy. Some wanted only modest-sized buildings on the site so as not to attract the attention of terrorists in the future. And finally it was decided that there would be a powerful memorial to the towers and the victims. I visited the memorial many times in the first few years we lived here in New York. All of our out-of-town visitors wanted to see it and we took them there. But in addition to the memorial and the museum, there was going to be a massive tower that once again made a statement about American strength and confidence. It took many years, but one World Trade Center rose to a symbolic 1,776 feet above ground zero and was dedicated in October 2014. It was a day to celebrate, but it was a celebration of progress built on the foundation of tragedy and grief. I'm not sure how many people are going back to work in that tower who worked in the original towers. I've not read any human interest stories like that. But if there are any people in that category, they might be able to relate to the ancient Hebrews. The mythical phoenix rising from the ashes is a powerful story of human survival and resilience. And for people of faith, rebuilding after tragedy is a testimony to the faithfulness of God. As we said in Psalm 136, God's steadfast love endures forever. The return of the people to worship once again in Jerusalem is an inspiring story that can help us understand some of the most intractable conflicts in our modern world. Today, both the modern state of Israel and the future state, hopefully, of Palestine lay claim to Jerusalem. For Israel, it has been a story of coming home for Millions of Jews fleeing persecution in Europe after the Holocaust of World War II. I remember hearing about the joy at discovering the Western Wall as Israeli forces took over the Temple Mount after the 1967 Six-Day War. Jews were so overcome with both joy and grief, just like in Ezra, at being able to touch the stones of Solomon's Temple that they called it the Wailing Wall for the sound of their weeping. I've been to the wall and it's very moving to tuck a prayer into the stones and who knows, maybe I've touched some of these same stones that the people laid in Ezra. And while it is a story of joy for the Jewish uh, diaspora, many of whom are living right here in New York as our neighbors, it has been a very different story for the Palestinian people who once lived in Jerusalem and villages throughout modern Israel. They were refugees of the 1948 war that created the state of Israel and they have longed 
to go home ever since. And if this story makes you uncomfortable, it should. As people of faith, we should care about suffering and injustice wherever it occurs. We should work towards the peace of Jerusalem that honors both the Jewish people who have been given a nation state after centuries of exile and prejudice, and at the same time recognize that there are now millions of refugees waiting for the world to help them find a home which offers a future for them and their families. Generations have now grown up in refugee camps in the West Bank, Jordan, and Lebanon. When we visited the Aida camp in Bethlehem in 2010, we met some amazing people. I'll never forget one young man who said he was 27 years old, but he was born in 1948. His point was that he was identifying with the struggle of his people from the beginning of their exile. Now, I don't claim to have an answer to the problem, but I'm encouraged by the stories of people from both sides who are working towards peace. Groups like Zahrot, an Israeli group, remembering and documenting lost Palestinian villages, and Badil, a Palestinian refugee agency. These are people who offer, hope that the, offer us hope that people of goodwill can work together for a peaceful solution with justice for all. And we know from the headlines that the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is a place near and dear to the hearts of both Jewish and Muslim people. And this story from Ezra gives us insight into just how deep that human longing goes. It taps into the deepest grief and the greatest joy, the pain of the refugee in exile and the joy of returning home. Well, these are big issues we can't solve here today, but the, there are some things we can take from this story that will guide us on our journey of faith as individuals and as a church community. In quick summary, there are three words that begin with the letter P that we should take from this story about the joy of returning home. And those words are past, place, and purpose. First, this story shows how important it is to remember the past. In Psalm 136, the people remembered all that God had done for them in the past. In memorials, it is important to remember the suffering and the sacrifice of others who have gone before. In our youth-oriented contemporary culture, it is easy to forget the past. But we can learn from our past as a nation and correct our mistakes as we build our shared future. As a church, we should honor those who have gone before and built the foundation of our church, both literally and metaphorically. In case you didn't know, this church used to worship in that white colonial church building on Kisco Avenue, just above the railroad tracks. It's now St. Francis AME Church, but it was built by the Presbyterian Society of Mount Kisco as our house of worship in the late 1800s. And I'm pleased to see that many of the architectural themes of that building were carried forward into this sanctuary. I invite you to Google images of PCMK and you will find many images still pop up from that old church and you'll be struck by the similarities from the pillars out front to these big windows and the white pews and pulpit. The past and our roots were obviously important to those who built this sanctuary. Some of those church members still with us and that is a good thing. We stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before, and others will stand on ours. The second P word, <laughs> place. Place is important, just as the past is important. It was important to the ancient Israelites, and it is important to Jews and Palestinians today. It's important to New Yorkers. Place is important. Place, a marker of what happened and who we are. I grew up in a different place, and as they say, you can take the boy out of the prairie, but you can never take the prairie out of the boy. I find the hills and trees of Westchester beautiful, but a little claustrophobic at times. When I drove across Illinois last month on my way to St. Louis, I was at home with the Midwest farmland all around me. Place is part of what defines home, which brings me to that final P word, purpose. As people of faith, we believe God has given us a past and a place for a purpose. We have a past that demonstrates the faithfulness of God. 
We have a place of worship. And then Mount Kisco in Westchester is our place of ministry. It is home to many who do not feel at home, and we should do our part to make our place a place of refuge and welcome for all God's children. They say you can't go home again. You can't go back to the way things were, and maybe that's the way it should be. But we can go home in the sense of creating a place of welcome and belonging for ourselves and for others. With recognition of God's presence in our past and in this place, let us renew our our commitment to our purpose of creating a place of refuge and shelter for all who long to go home again. Amen.